So it's my pleasure to welcome you back to this session on is dietary fiber an essential nutrient? I'd like to point out that um, this is sponsored by the ILSI North America Technical Committee on Carbohydrates, and uh, they also have supported the meeting as a whole. Um, this session is a little bit different from your typical academic session. We're going to have three 20 minute presentations, and then we're going to have an open discussion. And if you look at your, your meeting bag, you've already got the answer to this that dietary fiber is an essential nutrient. Not everybody in the room will agree with me, but the bags agree with me. So, why does it matter? Um, certainly matters for food labeling, it matters for dietary recommendations. Can we distinguish an essential nutrient from an essential dietary component? And there's a legal differentiation in that. Or, or are they actually the same functionally? Does the essentiality of fiber mean that there must be signs of deficiency? And if so, what are those signs? I don't have any answers for, for that. So you're going to get three perspectives today um, from myself. Um, and I've known me for a long time, and I've never known me to be wrong. Um, Joanne Slavin, who I've only known to be wrong once. And Dennis Gordon, who's kind of a sketchy ca character, but has a lot to say on this topic. Sorry, Dennis, couldn't avoid it. So each of us will have about 30 minutes, oh, sorry, 20 minutes, and 30 minutes for all of you to get up and speak your mind. So despite the statement on your meeting bags that fiber is essential, we, we really would like to come up with a, a sense of the group. Is fiber essential? And if so, why or why not? And I think that is the end of the slides. Okay, so I personally feel that fiber is one of those names that hasn't helped the business. Um, in fact, in the 1980s, Martin Eastwood wrote an editorial in The Lancet. And he said, using the term dietary fiber, is like using the term dietary vitamin. It really doesn't tell you what you need to know. And Martin was abused mercilessly by his colleagues about this um, for several years. So obviously, um, not everybody agrees um, that uh, fiber should be fibers. Um, I do need to make a disclosure. I actually um, am a consultant to Diets Incorporated. They're a manufacturer of laboratory animal diets. Um, this is actually approved um, every year by the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Ethics Office. And um, I don't have on here, which I think George disclosed, um, we are both advisors to the ILSI Technical Committee on Carbohydrates. I actually do that as official duty, so USDA defines that as not being a conflict of interest but it is an outside association that you should know about. So is the definition of dietary fiber a, a problem? And I've already alluded to that where I'd like to see the term converted into plural because we have multiple types of fiber and it's mostly polysaccharides, but it can be other stuff. In fact, it can be animal derived, um, chitin for instance. Um, there are a variety of methods used. Um, legally, fiber is the stuff that has the will to survive all of the various extractions and, and uh, cooking methods that, that are done. Um, they correlate somewhat, but uh, not as strong as you would like. You know, if, you, if you're running those correlations in your lab, that standard curve wouldn't pass. Um, but the methods all relate to the lack of digestion in the upper GI tract. 
So if the point is to get to the colon, what's it doing there? Is it simply increasing bulk of your feces? And I think it's there to feed the bacteria. Um, here's, here's a citation from Eric um, that shows one species of bacteroides alone has over 400 glycosidic hydrolases. And that's 25 times the number in the human GI tract. And when you have the hundreds of active bacteria that populate your gut, there are literally thousands of hydrolases available, and it makes perfect sense based on seasonality of intake as we evolved, we need to be able to handle different substrates. And if there weren't multiple species of bacteria there, you would be pooping out undigested leaves. And you can do that if you want to work for David Jenkins. So is fiber bioactive or essential? Um, several years ago, there was actually a proposed bioactive definition um, in the Federal Register by a, a group of um, federal agencies, and, and I've actually copied it here. It's more than several years now. It's 13 years ago. Constituents in foods or supplements other than those needed to meet basic human nutritional needs, which are responsible for changes in health status. So the key is having a health benefit. Um, the problem was, of course, that nobody agreed on this, and it was never published in final form. So the microbiome is needed for normal digestion. It's needed for some nutrient absorption. It's clearly needed for mucosal integrity. It contributes to host physiology and development and normal functioning of the immune system. So, and I think we actually do have some specific symptoms of deficiency that relate to the GI tube itself, things like diverticular disease. And you can see that in Western populations, 50% of people over the age of 70 have diverticular disease, whether or not they have symptoms of it. In traditional populations in developing countries that eat three, four times as much fiber as we do, don't have that at all, if anybody lives past 70. Um, related, the, the cause of, of diverticular is, is straining to pass a stool. So you, in, you hold your breath, you increase your intra-abdominal pressure. That also causes hemorrhoid formation, varicose veins of the rectum. And so there are, I think, it, it's not specific to having difficulty passing stool. Pregnant women develop hemorrhoids as a result of the uterus pressing on the vena cava. Um, but there are a variety of deficiency symptoms for a lack of fiber that I think can be directly attributable to this. And in fact, there's a paper in Journal of Nutrition in the 1980s using a lifetime feeding of rats on a fiber-free diet, and 50% of them develop diverticula of the colon. So one of the important questions is, why should we rely on bacteria for energy? You know, we've got this 20-foot-long tube of small intestine that the physiologists taught me when I was in school, absorb everything we need. Well, that wasn't quite right. And in fact, the bacteria are there because we have, at least we used to have, seasonal different intakes of dietary factors, whether it's sources or over time. So no single organism has the ability to metabolize those varied non-digestible nutrients that make it to the colon. So multiple microbial species allow the ability to respond literally within hours by producing a bloom of specific bacteria that can digest whatever you just ate four hours earlier. Um, I think it was Eric who corrected me this morning. I, I did find a paper that says horizontal transfer of genetic material across bacterial strains in the gut can be 40 to 50 percent. Eric thinks it's around 10 percent. I have no idea who's right on that. Um, so, so I'll trust Eric. He's an expert in this. Um, but there's lots of plasmids. There's bacteriophage. 
there's direct transfer of genes. Um, almost everything you read uh, about um, the intestinal microbiome is focused on bacteria and focused on proportions of bacteria or ratios of bacteria. And any of you who work with ratios know that small changes in one can have a big effect on your ratio. Um, fungi, archaea, viruses also play a role. Fungi are very active in cellulolytic decomposition. Um, actually seem to be, there's a paper in Science um, in 2014 showing very high affinity of certain fungal strains for digesting cellulose. So th this is basically why you have small numbers of strains of bacteria. You, you got one there and all of a sudden you have five million there. Nobody's laughing at my slide. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I can continue now. So fiber is really, as you've heard before, part of plants, but it's chemically related compounds. The question, of course, is can fiber distinguish between an intrinsic intact fiber source and an added and or synthetic fiber source? And I don't think anybody can answer that at this point. Um, there's other stuff um, that fiber, or sorry, that microbiome use, um, resistant starch, which quantitatively may be as much as fiber, particularly in a low fiber background like most of us are, ex are exposed to. Um, but there's unabsorbed macronutrients. And again, you know, if we talk about the generation of a field in science, when I was a graduate student, I was taught that 100% of protein and fat is absorbed in the small bowel. Whether or not we knew that was true in the 19, early 1970s or not, um, that's what I was taught. It's in Guyton's physiology book. Um, but you know, it's one of the questions I have about whole grains. Um, are whole grains bringing small amounts of these macronutrients into the colon to be chomped on by the microbiota. And you heard this morning from Eric about shifting between exogenous fiber and endogenous mucin. Um, bacteria happen to be cannibals. They eat their cousins. And 50% of bacterial mass is bacteria. And a lot of it's dead. Um, I don't know that we have methods to distinguish live from dead bacteria. That was one of the comments that came up in the workshop uh, in the last two days. A lot of slough cells, you know, your lining of your intestine turns over every few days. It's tens of billions of cells. And then we have individual habits of eating all day long or in large meals. And, and that's, that's one of the keys, is the driver for sustainability of a species. And every animal species that's multi-celled has evolved with a microbiome in its gut. So the main driver is two things. It's eating, and it's usually eating stuff that isn't easily digested, and it's sex. I'm not going to talk about sex. You're welcome. Um, so th th this is actually a very important study that was in science a few years ago now. At the top, you'll see um, 16S derived uh, OTUs, operational taxonomic units, and the colors here distinguish, the green are herbivores, the blue are omnivores, and the red are carnivores. And you can see they're easily distinguishable. But if you look at the functional genes in the bottom panel B, the Keg orthology groups, there's no clear pattern that everybody has, um, what, no matter what your diet is, um, what, and there are plenty of strict carnivores here, the, the central part are the enzymes shared with the herbivores. So the ability in cats in particular to digest dietary fiber is inherent. And this is um, another study from Fred Backhead. Uh, in humans, on the left, we see um, identification through OTUs of 
bacterial identification, it doesn't matter what phyla are there, but you can see a lot of zigging and zagging um, from person to person. And each one of those marks is a different individual. But then on the right, you see the functional categories, and there's really not a remarkable difference in those same individuals. They have the ability, not necessarily that they're all functioning at that same level, they have the ability to digest the similar amounts of material. And in fact, th this is the uh, slide that I, I mentioned from um, science on, on the ability of cellulose to be digested by various fungal species. And um, there's three species here. They even digest crystalline cellulose. Um, on the left, um, three here is uh, glucose. So very different ability of, of these three um, fungal um, species. But then you look at the um, cell of bios, avicel, sigma cell. Um, it's not like they're digesting the majority of it, but they can digest even microcrystalline cellulose and the various grasses that non-human primates will eat. Most of us don't eat corn stover or switchgrass. Um, th this is an important study um, that in e each one of these um, bar graphs represents the microbiome from a child. And these are kids either with short bowel syndrome on parental nutrition, kids with short bowel syndrome who've been weaned from parental nutrition, or their healthy siblings. And what I want to point out here is there are five boxes that I've encircled by red bars. Those are the kids on parental nutrition with short bowel syndrome. Look how homogeneous their um, microbiome is. There's only one to three species of bacteria present, or sorry, um, phyla present um, in, in these. Um, they just lose the ability to sustain uh, bacteria with the absence of nutrition flowing through the GI tract, and it's not due to the presence of short bowel syndrome. Um, I, I want to point out that, um, again, I was taught that butyrate gets used by the colonic uh, epithelium, that propionate um, is removed in first pass by the liver, and that acetate is the only short-chain fatty acid that circulates. And that's nonsense. That just is not true. Um, all three of them circulate in, in low levels. And in fact, there are receptors all throughout uh, tissues, including the central nervous system. And I think I mentioned that b before lunch. Um, but you can see that um, most of these are G protein coupled receptors, um, but they avidly bind short chain fatty acids. So the microbiome has multiple um, functions and affects the uh, GI epithelium. It, you've already heard a little bit about how it probably prevents um, disease induction by GI pathogens that are there all the time. Um, there are a number of chronic diseases that are modulated by the microbiome. Uh, Karen gave you a longer list than I have here. Um, but there are a number of old observations made by some of the pioneers in, in the field. And, and I blame this a lot on PubMed, because when you do a, a, a Medline search, you get the most recent thing first. And when you get 420 papers, you don't usually go back to papers 380 through 420. You'll be satisfied with the first 20 or so. And so it's really important for the younger folks in the room to realize that there's a lot of old literature on dietary fiber, um, dating back to the 70s and 80s especially. Um, transit time, um, Dennis Burkett used to talk about this all the time, about decreasing exposure to the mucosa to toxins that he thought might be in the diet, but also decreasing exposure 
to microbial metabolites, like some of the protein um, digestion um, uh, products that, that were talked about this morning that are clearly toxic to the epithelium. Uh, acidification of the gut, uh, again, Alec Walker published on this repeatedly, and it changes function of the bacteria dramatically. Just a half a pH unit will change the optima of a lot of these exoenzymes. Um, stool volume is very important. Um, if, if there is a fixed proportion of bacteria in the stool, um, then doubling the stool mass doubles the bacteria there. You know, microbiologists biologists don't get excited about a doubling. They want to see a one log or a tenfold increase. But a doubling might be statistically significant. It certainly would be for stool mass. And you're certainly diluting um, metabolites, in particular secondary bile acids, which have strong cytotoxic effects on the epithelium and on various bacterial species. And we talked about Bristol stool scale. Um, stool hardness could be a factor simply by abrasiveness. For years when I was in academics, I was looking for a machine to be able to standardly test stool abrasiveness, and such a machine doesn't exist. If anybody knows about it, come up and tell me after the session, because I will buy it. Um, one of the problems for my hypothesis is that there have actually been a, a few studies that looked harder stools actually have greater microbial, microbial diversity than softer stools. So maybe my idea is wrong, but I'd still love to be able to test it experimentally. And um, in a harder stool, you should get less diffusion of bacterial metabolites. And now we certainly know with metabolomics that we can get a lot of absorption through the colonic mucosa of bacterial metabolites. So this is my last slide to sum up, that there are a lot of easy answers, but this field is really complex. And I think rather than taking questions after each talk, we'll call up Dr. Slavin to clarify everything. <laughs>